Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in. So I'm Rashmi Krishna Sethi. I'm a principal engineer working with Amazon Key Spaces. And joining with me today, I have Rohan, uh, Rohan Gupta, who is the other engineer working with Key, Amazon Key Spaces for Apache Cassandra. And today, we'll start with uh, Amazon Key Spaces uh, overview on uh, what it is and how we built it. We'll talk about how we architected it to be highly scalable and highly available as well. And we'll also talk about the features uh, of Amazon Key Spaces. And Rohan here will also be talking in detail about how they were built to provide a seamless experience for the customers. And we'll end the session with some key takeaways and any Q&A uh, that you might have. So Amazon Key Spaces for Apache Cassandra is a scalable, highly available, and fully managed database service. It's Apache Cassandra compatible. That means that you can use your SQL code uh, to manage your tables, create tables, man uh, manage tables, read and write data, anything that you can do in uh, with a regular Cassandra. You can uh, use your regular drivers, developer tools that you already use. Using Apache Cass using uh, Amazon Key Spaces is as simple as changing your Cassandra endpoint to Amazon Key Spaces service endpoint, and it automatically works uh, everything. And you can use your Cassandra migration tools to migrate any data you need to uh, from one one place to the Amazon Key Spaces. Right. And it is fully managed, which means it doesn't have any servers that you have to manage. Uh, no servers. It also doesn't have like any tombstone compaction strategies that you have to manage. It's basically managed by Amazon Key Spaces, meaning by us, uh, behind the scenes for you. And we'll talk about in detail a little bit more about like you know how we how we land up doing that as we talk through uh, the architecture. And uh, serverless also means that you don't have to provision, configure, uh, or like you know operate these large Cassandra clusters. And the tables in uh, this with Cassandra or the Amazon Key Spaces will automatically scale up and down. And depending upon the provision mode or the on-demand capacity mode that you end up using, like you can um, automatically your tables can scale up and down depending on the load that is coming in. And uh, you know it's virtually unlimited scale, which means that there is no limit on the size of the table or the number of rows that you have in the table. And at that virtually unlimited size, uh, you still get single digit millisecond performance. Right. And it's highly available, uh, meaning like we provide 5.9 SLA with multi-region replication and 4.9 um, SLA for uh, single region uh, key spaces table. And it integrates with a lot of other AWS services that we already have today, uh, be it like AWS identity and access management for authentication, uh, KMS for encryption keys, and uh, AWS CloudWatch uh, for providing the data that uh, the metrics, for example, like about if you want to understand how is your key spaces table doing in terms of throttling, metrics, performance, etc. All of that data will be readily available for you to build a dashboard on or anything with Amazon, uh, you know, AWS CloudWatch system. So thousands of customers across financial sectors, banking, media, entertainment are already using uh, AWS key spaces for their Cassandra workloads. And we even have some customers like Intuit who have migrated 100 plus terabyte uh, workload to Amazon key spaces. So looking back at the architecture, right? Like this, let's say we take through the select query, right? We have um, uh, the architecture where the client application is talking to key spaces. The key spaces itself uses the Apache Cassandra's modular architecture, but it is reimagined to provide a fully managed service. So what does that mean? So behind the scenes, when you provide this uh, key spaces endpoint, we go ahead and resolve the DNS, and that gives you an endpoint to choose from, right? Like so, which connects to one of the Amazon key spaces node. The first thing that we land up doing is authenticate and authorize your request. And for this, we integrate with AWS Identity and Access Management, also commonly known as IAM. And with IAM, you actually get a lot of fine-grained access control policies which, with which you can decide who can or can't uh, access your tables. Like in, and you can control it at per operation, like in terms of like select, insert, et cetera. Right? Once we know the request is secure, at that point, we actually go ahead and route this request to the storage partition to fetch that data. 
and the storage here is built based on the learnings from building other massive large scale databases which can handle millions of requests too. And we maintain multiple copies of this data so that it's the requests are, uh, you know, your data is highly durable, highly available and secure as well. And uh, the storage is also built in such a way that like, you know, we take care of this garbage collection, TTL, compaction, etc., that you normally see with Cassandra workloads, right? And we'll talk in a little bit more detail of how is the storage actually partitioned in the next few slides. So that's for the select. What happens with an insert, for example? With an insert, the request is still going through the authentication authorization, then it hits one of the storage partitions, and this storage partition now ensures that it talks to the other storage partitions in the system, right? And by default, Amazon Keyspaces provides you with a local quorum consistency. This means that it ensures that at least two of the storage partitions have durably written this data before we acknowledge it back. So zooming out, we have a client application uh, hitting the service endpoint, but we have many service endpoints across different availability zones. We have different key space services uh, nodes, and then we have multiple storage partitions. And like you can see, we show at least three availability zones here because we replicate the data at least in three availability zones. And we do this so that even if one availability zone is impaired, for example, in this case, AZ2 is impaired, you know, we will re-resolve the DNS to an endpoint which is actually active right now, and then your request will be flowing through without any interruption. They will just be routed through a different endpoint which is actively working, and um, you should not be able to see any like you know availability or performance impacts with it. So now that we understand like you know how this request flow works, let's understand how the table data itself is organized. So at a high level, the table is basically made of multiple storage partitions and it is divided based on the key spaces, like you know, spe specific parts of the tables are stored in certain storage partitions. And we are cognizant of how much a partition can perform. We limit that to 3000 RCUs or 1000 WCUs. And, uh, one RCU or read capacity unit is basically capable of uh, providing you up to 4 KB of data. So if you're doing, let's say, a select which is returning you 8 KBs of data, uh, we consume like two RCUs or tokens behind the scenes. And uh, in case of, um, let's say, this is where the local quorum consistency, but if it's like a local one consistency, then we consume half of that because now we can just distribute your request to across all of these storage partitions more equally and use more of your resource, more of our resources. And with a WCU one, WCU or write capacity units can provide you up to one KB of data read. And by default, there's a local quorum consistency. And we limit it to this much because we want that limit on how much in each storage partition can handle. Because that way we know we can scale and we can scale without having a noisy neighbor impact or any other issues that you might land up seeing. So what happens if, you know, now customer wants additional throughput? Then we basically land up dynamically increasing the number of partitions so that we get actually double the throughput or double the storage as well, right? And uh, we do this without you know, the customer really recognizing this, like, you know, we do this behind the scenes and customers can provide us hint by increasing their RCU or WCU on the table and we land up increasing there as well. So this works great, but what if there is a skew in this request pattern, right? Like, I mean, if it's all uniform, then it scales, it just divides, and like you can get the double the throughput, for example. In case of a skewed pattern, let's take this example, like for partition A. Let's assume that like there is a sustained traffic on this partition, like let's say row foo and row bar. So now your throughput is also limited. So what we land up doing in that particular case is the system is constantly monitoring for such a use case, where if it reaches above a certain utilization, we automatically go and identify, you know, hey, where is this uh, hotness or heat coming from, right? And we go ahead and ensure that we divide or split this partition in such a way that the row foo and row bar are in two different partitions so that you can double your throughput without any issues, right? And this splitting of partitions also help you with storage as well. 
So that's basically the high level architecture. Um, now uh, Rohan will talk us about like, you know, some of the features that we have today and like, you know, how, how we build that, like let's say point in time recovery and time to leave and like all of those features that you'll end up seeing with Cassandra as well. Oh. Hey everyone, um, my name is Rohan Gupta and I'm a software engineer on the Amazon Key Spaces team. Uh, and I'll be today walking you through some of the key features offered by Amazon Key Spaces and how we actually build them. So starting with point in time recovery or Pitter. So Pitter basically helps you to um, recover your data in case of accidental deletions or updates. And Pitter has absolutely no impact on the performance or the scalability or the, per or the availability of the data. Yeah, and so with Pitter, you can restore your table to any second in time within the past 35 days. And how we do Pitter is um, you can actively select the table or you choose your tables which you want to enable the Pitter on. And the pricing is based on the size of the table. And it is like very, it's highly recommended to enable Pitter on all your production tables. So how did we actually went and uh, built Pitter behind the scenes? So let's dive a bit deeper into the architecture. Um, so as Rashmi mentioned before, like a table is comprised of multiple storage partitions. And so let's take an example of a table uh, which has like three partitions. Uh, blue partition, purple partition, and orange partition. So we are building logs uh, for each partition independently, and we are storing them in our S3 bucket. And uh, yeah, so we basically periodically and continuously back up these uh, logs in S3. And in addition to the logs, we are also taking snapshots of the table data from time to time. And we are encrypting these snapshots with a Amazon KMS key or the customer provided uh, CMK. And so why do we basically take snapshots? So basically this is an optimization over just storing logs. If we try to build the restored copy of the table just with the logs, it will take us a longer time and that increases the time to do Pitter. So basically this is an optimization to reduce the total time taken for Pitter. And for a given table for each partition, we are storing the logs and snapshots together. So at a particular time, we have multiple shots, uh, multiple snapshots and logs for the table in S3. Now let's say a customer, you as a customer, you delete your, some of your data that you didn't intend to, or you do some updates that was not supposed to do. So key spaces makes it really simple and easy to recover your data to a previous good state. To do that basically, uh, we take a restore time from the customer and we first validate that it is a valid restore time. It is in the past 35 days. And once that is validated, we go further and we go into the S3 and we look the, for the snapshot, which has the most recent version of your data. Once we get the snapshot, we take the restore time and the snapshot time and we get the logs between those and we apply forward any changes that happen to the snapshot and yeah, so we do this process continuously for all the partitions, which basically results into the whole restore table. Now, moving on to another feature, which is time to live, or we call it TTL. With TTL, you can basically insert a row or a cell with the TTL value, which is in seconds, and basically the row disappears uh, after that certain, certain seconds. So queries don't return expired uh, rows or cells. And records are removed uh, from the storage uh, by a background compaction process, and which is typically within 10 seconds, within 10 days. And this does not, any, this does not have any impact on the performance or availability of the table as well, because this process is completely asynchronous and this runs uh, like as a background process so how do we actually do the compaction in background? Let's dive a bit deeper into this. Uh, so we have a fleet of hosts uh, for this particular use case. And we already mentioned that we continuously take the snapshots of the table and store in S3 to do Pitter. 
And we use the same snapshots to do the TTL compactions as well. And why do we use the snapshot? If we directly go and do a read on a table, that will be a very costly operation for both us and the customer. So instead, we use the snapshots instead to do the use case. So basically, a TTL host go to the S3. It gets the partition, the most latest snapshots. It then compacts the snapshot. It basically removes the expired cells and rows. And it then writes back to the storage partitions. And all this happens in the background. So it does not have any performance impact. Now let's see another feature uh, which we recently launched, multi-region replication. Multi-region replication helps you to uh, get a fully managed active-to-active -active replication across all AWS regions, which helps customer to basically build globally distributed applications. And you can read and write data to any region across the globe. And the replication lag within regions is typically within uh, a second. So how does multi-region replication actually work? Uh, first, the application writes data into the table in a given region. Then the table, then the data is successfully written in, this, in, this, in that particular local region across three AZs. And then we send the success back. And finally, that, uh, that data, we have a replication service, which basically send the log records across the other regions configured in the multi-region key space. And the other region basically accepts those inserts. And this, this step happens asynchronously in key spaces. What about handling conflicts? Like, like in key spaces architecture, we don't have a leader. So all, all nodes can have inserts at the same time. How do we handle conflicts for the same keys? So in key spaces, the last writer wins. We use that method of data reconciliation. And all regions agree, agree to the latest update based on the cell level timestamp. And but there can be cases that the timestamps are equal. In that case, we go with the larger value of the data type, of the of the cell basically. So we have a strict ordering. We do a strict ordering of the data type, and we then select the largest value out of those. So for example, if it's a string, we do the lexo, we take the lexicographically larger string. So jello will be greater than hello. So jello will be accepted. In case of integers, the large integer. And in case of collections, uh, we, we do a canonical ordering of the data type, and we, can, and we figure out the bigger uh, out of the collection. Um, yeah, so basically all nodes across follow, in key spaces across all the regions, follow the same um, data reconciliation process, which makes this whole process more deterministic. And this uh, basically results into the same image of the item across all regions. And any conflicts or divergence in, like, in key spaces is automatically handled. So moving on to some of the key takeaways, Amazon key spaces is serverless, which makes customers, which means customers don't have to like provision, patch, or manage any servers. They don't have to install, maintain, or operate any kind of software. Customers don't have to worry about configuring other processes like compaction strategies, managing tombstones, JVMs, garbage collections, etc. Uh, table is made of multiple storage partitions, which are spread across multiple servers across regions, uh, across availability zones in a region. And we offer high traffic isolation and partition splits for better throughput and more storage. And there's virtually unlimited storage and throughput for a table. And finally, we're fully managed uh, with a per table granularity. Many of our features work at a per table level, like Pitter and like TTL, and they do not impact, uh, enabling them do not impact the performance or the availability of the table. We have some other sessions going on in the summit. Uh, you should attend, like, uh, they're quite uh, informative. And we have a workshop also going on, that's tomorrow, 11.50 which you can attend, and we have a dinner reception. And if you have any detailed question, we also have a booth where you can drop by and we can answer any of your questions. And yeah, and we're open to any questions. Yep, please, go ahead.
So behind the scenes, right, like, so at the end of the day, what you're looking at is for a given key, right, like, so Cassandra is also, a, like, basically a key value lookup. So for a given key, it's basically we calculate what we call it as, like, hash of that key. And based on that hash of that key, we go and figure out, like, you know, which is the right partition to actually store or route this request to. And this is where uh, the one thing that we didn't talk about in these slides is like, you know, we also have another thing like metadata systems, which actually provide you that data. So let's say if the, if the storage partitions basically become bigger or larger, if we have to split, then that is basically put back, pushed back through metadata systems. We get hint back directly from storage partitions to the key spaces, party, key spaces nodes or through metadata systems. We get that hint back now saying that like, you know, hey, this data is, is now split, so these are the new partitions now. So this is where you need to route your next request to. And this is basically all an atomic operation when the split happens. It's like, you know, um, we have three nodes and then like it becomes kind of like a six node cluster where it now becomes like two child partitions. And that, that process is basically atomic so that there's only one, at any point in time, there's only one partition just taking that request. Uh, I think, I, I, I mean, we might, I mean, we have some data on like how uh, key spaces performs in terms of like single digit millisecond performance, etc. And if you're looking for exact benchmark, maybe you can come by the booth and like we can talk in more detail about like exactly what type of performance you're looking at. Like, you know, is it availability? Is it latencies? Is it the cost performance that you're looking at? So there is like usually various factors that come into picture. Uh, when you're looking at a specific performance. Uh, sure. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. I could actually you know, take that one. Currently, we don't support adding replication regions to a multi-region key space, but we support creating new tables uh, or new key spaces, uh, net new. Um, yeah, so currently we cannot support that feature as of now. But you can, uh, we have certain timelines. I think you can come to our booth and we can, you can, the product team can help you with that. Sure. Uh, the Cassandra features uh, versus the Robinson key spaces features exactly don't uh, work in a similar fashion in terms of like the version deprecations or uh, that you see with 3.11x and everything. But that being said, like, you know, we do have like a feature roadmap to keep it, uh, you know, to support more and more of those features that you also see with Cassandra 5 or other things. But yeah, if there is a specific feature that you're interested in, like we could definitely work with our product uh, team here. Like, I mean, we have meet here, like who can help you with like trying to understand and like, uh, you know, what feature you're interested in and like where in that, where in our roadmap does that align to? Uh, sure. Uh, I think. And when you say performance, are you talking about the price per? Latency. Got it. Uh, currently, we don't provide any SLAs for latencies. Uh, what we kind of promise is like single digit millisecond latencies at any kind of scale that you have that you want but we don't provide a uh, specific SLA um, sure uh, you had a question you want to take that or um, I, I, I'm we, we admit we have so we integrate with like Amazon uh, 
Cloud, CloudWatch. So you can go and you can tune, you can see your metrics for, for inserts or, yeah. So you, you can basically monitor your uh, latencies uh, using CloudWatch. So usually there are kind of different classes of metrics. Like let's say if you're looking at performance, you can look at your uh, latencies per operation, per table uh, that you have. Like we also put our, uh, put in like, you know, throttles, for example. Uh, we kind of also show you capacity utilization metrics. Like for example, like what is your provision capacity, consume capacity, those kind of things as well. So there is usually an array of different side types of metrics. Uh, kind of yes. So if you're looking for specific operation level, like specific key, like specific things, like I mean, you could, uh, like what the service level things that you kind of see in the cloud watch is like aggregated at the operation and at the table level. Like if you want more detailed uh, metrics, like if you're debugging something, for example, like one of the things that you can also do is like integrate with other systems like AWS X-Ray, for example, to get uh, those detailed metrics of like, you know, hey, what is my queries, how long did it take, like at your client level as well. And also to add that, we also have a cloud trail integration for DDL operations. So that also gives you an insight. Um, yeah, especially if you want to audit like the writes that is going on in your systems. Uh, no, not right now. I mean, are, are you kind of curious about like a text search, like vector search? I'm just curious yeah, about like your use case. Got it. Uh, no, right now we don't provide that. I mean, it's basically still a key, key value looker, but yeah. I think, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.